I'm Mark. We have Ruben and Mauricio here, Doug in the back. We're going to be going over some of the serverless working group uh, information. That includes an overview of the serverless working group, uh, you know, the kind of the summary and status of that. Uh, since we started the serverless working group, there's been different developments in the technology. We're going to just comment a little bit on that as well uh, and uh, talk about cloud events. Uh, then, uh, you know, Ruben and Mauricio are going to talk workflow specification, uh, which should be very interesting. And then uh, Doug is going to lead us in a birds of a feather community discussion. So that's where all of you get to uh, chime in, give us your opinions, and uh, help, help us out with uh, future directions on that. I will commend all of you for uh, making it to this time slot. We picked it especially because we knew that if you showed up here, you really wanted to be here, and I appreciate that. So if we look back to 2017, there wasn't a serverless working group. And we were look, some of us were getting together on the CNCF talk calls and discussing, you know, what is this serverless thing? It was pretty popular in, in public cloud, but, you know, there, there's just a lot of unknowns around uh, all of the open source projects that were going on back then. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, uh, if, you, if you follow this awesome serverless link, you know, there, there were just a lot of open source offerings around serverless, but no clear direction as to where it was going. But we knew that it was a very good design pattern for cloud native architectures. And so we went to the CNCF uh, talk and said, you know, we think that there's more here uh, that we want to explore. Can we create a working group around this? and uh, then go off and, and, and look at it. Uh, we really didn't want to constrain you know, the innovation around it, but we wanted to just get some kind of opinion about what, what was going on. Uh, and we did see some initial needs around function portability, service interoperability, uh, eventing. And so we, we didn't go into it you know, kind of blind, not knowing where we wanted to go, but we also didn't have an answer for where we would go. And so we, we got this uh, kicked off. Um, and, and so we did, we did say we wanted to get more of a common terminology around what serverless was uh, and uh, the, you know, kind of define the scope for everything that was going on there. Uh, it's interesting that we did say early on that we wanted to do a white paper in a position paper because it really gave us a direction, a guiding light as to what was our first deliverable. How could we go out and look at the industry, at the open source projects, at the technologies associated with serverless and condense that into an opinion paper, a position paper. Uh, and, and so that, that, that actually uh, worked out quite well. So how did we do? We started this, we kicked off the serverless working group in mid 2017, and we've had weekly meetings ever since then. Uh, believe me, it's always fun to have weekly meetings, uh, especially over vacations and everything else, uh, but uh, the, the team has done a tremendous job keeping the focus on some of, some of the activities that we wanted to get accomplished. And so at the beginning of 2018, we released the white paper that uh, I think we had over 30 uh, individuals and companies participate uh, in that white paper, uh, and that was published out for everyone to, to view. Uh, you, if you go to um, the CNCF WG-serverless uh, uh, GitHub site, you can download the white paper, take a look at it. Along the way, we also uh, did a landscape. You know, what are all these open source projects? How could we slot them into, you know, what's a function as a service? What's a framework? Uh, and, and just try to understand that landscape a little bit more. Uh, that work was actually incorporated into the CNCF landscape. And so you can, you know, filter on serverless and, and get additional information about where, where the projects are and uh, what, what they are up to. So the white paper, um, you know, we, we did do, uh, you know, state of, state of the ecosystem, but we also came up with some recommendations for, for the next steps. Uh, and 
one of the things that resounded with all of us was understanding cloud events. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a couple of slides, but uh, it's been a, a, a great process to go through uh, cloud events. We started it in December 2017, and then by May 2018, we decided that it, needed, it shouldn't live inside the serverless working group, that we needed to pull it out into its own project. So we created a sandbox project under the CNCF, uh, and then it was, it's now able to you know, live on its own. We can, we can have a team of people dedicated to just you know, helping out with the specification for cloud events, working on the different SDKs associated with that, uh, and we can keep it independent of a working group because we felt that it was a real project. It should be a, a standalone en entity. And I'm really happy to say that just recently in October, we were able to get to a version 1.0 of cloud events. Yay! And we were able to get to incubator status within the CNCF. So we're, we're, we're very proud about uh, being able to uh, take it that far. Uh, we are looking to graduate at some point when we get you know, more adoption of cloud events. Uh, and we're hoping that uh, now that we've gotten to the 1.0, we can get more people contributing into it and using it uh, because it's, it's really cool technology. Uh, the other initiative that we had was around the workflow and we'll be giving an update right after I get finished with uh, uh, the cloud events work uh, comments. I talked about developments in serverless and what we've seen is that there has been this industry shift that as you look at AWS Lambda, Azure Functions, Google Cloud Functions, all of those technologies are event-driven, being able to take an event in, run some compute, be able to interact with back-end services, and uh, deliver value for, for customers. And uh, you know, we're, we are living in an event-driven world nowadays, and we think that this is you know, something that will continue to make serverless uh, very interesting, at least functions as a service. You know, serverless, you'll have to read the white paper, but we go into the difference between serverless functions as a service, and I, I tend to just group them all together. Um, we've also had changes occur in the serverless fast world. Uh, you know, Knative serving came along earlier this year uh, that uh, has, has changed how we think about what is serving of a serverless workload. Uh, OpenFAS was just beginning in 2017 and has grown uh, dramatically with a lot of different, uh, you know, a huge uh, community around it, uh, being able to, to provide a very easy to use uh, functions as a service. Other projects are still going strong, OpenWhisk, Riff, along with uh, you know, the, the others that I have listed there, like Nucleo and Fission. Uh, I'd say there hasn't been the consolidation that I thought would happen by now uh, of some of these projects, but I also think that each of these projects have some unique characteristics that uh, make them interesting for the communities that they serve. There's also recently some, some uh, event-driven projects like Kata uh, that is a Kubernetes event-driven event autoscaler so that as events come in, it can figure out whether to scale to zero or scale up uh, uh, Kubernetes pods. Uh, that uh, is fairly early on, uh, in, uh, but we think that that one is interesting. Uh, Dapper, distributed application runtime. It's a way to rethink how uh, microservice uh, runtimes should be structured and uh, be able to now build that into uh, so some of the containerized uh, solutions. And then Knative eventing. Uh, again, we, we see Knative as, as being a fundamental uh, set of technologies that uh, tie uh, well into Kubernetes and the eventing part of it is, is very important. It also uh, incorporates into it uh, the, the cloud events uh, work that we've been doing. And so you get native cloud, cloud events uh, being built into that. 
a shout out to Scott for doing a lot of good work on the Go SDK uh, for, for cloud events. Uh, and I'd, I'd say that with Knative in general, that they have helped to blur the line between platform as a service, container as a service, and functions as a service. Uh, it was a big debate that we had as we were going through the serverless working group of you know, what, how is functions different from a platform as a service or container as a service? And there are nuances about that, uh, you know, somewhat scale to zero, uh, be, being able to um, have more event-driven stateless applications. Uh, but what we're, what we're now seeing a couple of years later is that line is getting blurred. If you can get it down in, if you can build it into a container, uh, then it can be served up uh, uh, same way as anything else. So stay tuned to that. It'll, it'll be interesting to see how that uh, uh, evolves over the next, the, the next two years. So I want to thank Clemens for letting me steal a couple of his slides to talk about cloud events. If you didn't attend his talk earlier today, uh, I suggest uh, you know, pulling that up uh, on uh, when the video gets released. Uh, we had uh, Clemens and several others talk about their usage of cloud events uh, in the cloud events uh, update. So why cloud events? What we were seeing is that events that were occurring, especially like in public cloud, uh, that events were very localized, they were, they were very constrained in terms of how you could interpret them, and they really stayed within the ecosystem of the public clouds, such that Azure, Azure events stayed within Azure, uh, AWS stayed within AWS. And we really felt that there needed to be a way to take events, be able to label them, and transmit them across multiple clouds. Uh, I come from an email background, so you know the way I think about it is email, there's an envelope and then there's the body. The envelope helps to deliver uh, the message, uh, which is the body. Uh, you know, if that doesn't resonate with you, think about you know, just sending a no normal postal letter that you, know, you put an address on, on the outside of the envelope, you put your letter in there, gets delivered. That's the same kind of thing that we're doing with, with cloud events which is if you have, in this use case, uh, in this diagram, you might have an IoT device that's generating that original event. I may not know exactly what is contained within that event, but if I put a, 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 a wrapper around it and say, it's this type of event, and then be able to pass that on, I can now transit that across through multiple clouds, multiple systems, without having to understand the actual content of that, of that event. And it's tremendously powerful as you look at being able to do multi-cloud deliveries, being able, to, being able to, such as in this use case, being able to take something from IoT, transit it through several systems, and be able to process it as it's going across all of these different transports as well. So what did we do there? We uh, created a specification that talked about what is the common metadata, that envelope uh, attributes that, that uh, we defined in order to uh, uh, you know, mark up the, the, the event and be able to pass it along. Uh, and so we wanted to make that very simple to uh, reason about, uh, simple to be able to parse as you're passing it between these systems. And we also included in with that a lot of different transport options such as MQ, uh, MQTT, MQP, uh, and HTTP. Because uh, you know, obviously we need, to, we need to be able to move that event through all of these systems. And then we, we've, we have a st standard encoding using JSON, but we also understand that there are transports that need binary, or, or for efficiency, they want binary uh, encodings. And so we, we made sure that uh, we could take that into account as well. So what's next? You know, I, I'm talking about a couple of different projects here. One is serverless working group, and the other is this cloud events that got, that, that got uh, spun out of the serverless working group. At, we're doing workflow as well, but 
we're now looking at, as a serverless working group, what is it that we want to do next? We had a two-hour meeting, a uh, face-to-face -face meeting of the, of the team, uh, the core team that has been working on these for quite a while yesterday, and we came up with, you know, what are our wish lists? And I'm prefacing this uh, before Doug goes into and asks all of you to give your opinions. I'm prefacing, prefacing this so that you can see this list and start thinking about what would be important to you? Would packaging, a packaging contract, would that be, would that be more important than, say, function signatures or a way to have more portability of, of functions? Uh, we also think that having discoverability of, uh, these, of um, the, the events, being able to say, what events can you produce, uh, would, would be interesting. How about uh, uh, being able to understand more of the schema associated with that, having discovery of those schemas? And so we really have a whole laundry list of items. I'm going to let Doug go into them in more detail and have that discussion. But I just wanted to preface this so that you start thinking about what would be important for you for the serverless working group to take on next. So with that, we'll start talking about workflow. Hello. Hey. Hello. Yes. All right. Well, I guess you, yeah. you go first. Uh, thanks for coming. And I, we wanted to give a brief introduction of uh, what the serverless workflow specification is and uh, what we are trying to do, what we have done so far, and, and what we think we need to go to get there. So my name is Ruben Romero. And I've been involved with the serverless workflow for a few months only, but uh, this is a, a work that has been uh, for a while. And um, uh, so for now, we, there, we are four people uh, actively working on, on the specification. Uh, one is uh, Kathy, Kathy Hong from Huawei, who has been uh, coordinating the, the, the work so far since the beginning. Another, another person is uh, Tihomir Surdilovic, also from Red Hat. Uh, he has done a huge work on, on, uh, since we uh, joined this uh, project uh, to move forward the, the specification, so we have to mention them as well. And now I, I will leave uh, Mauricio to yeah. introduce himself. And, uh, yeah, and my name is Mauricio Salatino at Salavoy in Twitter, and I do work for a company, and uh, hi, I have been doing uh, workflow automation for some time, and now I've been, like, I work for four companies on the workflow space in the last 10 years, so, uh, and uh, previously worked at Red Hat as well. Uh, but yeah, let's talk a little bit about what's happening in this uh, group. Let's see if you, oops, that's it. So first of all, the scope, right? So what is this group trying to achieve for now, right? Like they, the current iteration that we are trying to work on is pretty much the workflow orchestration language, right? And I think that language is the important word in that first, in that first line, right? So we are trying to define a spec, to define a language, to define workflow orchestrations for serverless applications, right? Uh, the main objective of that language is to be concise, portable, and vendor neutral. Right? In order to achieve that, we are just looking into different implementations, different tools uh, from different vendors, and also bringing some experience from the past to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes that other tools and other specifications have made. Uh, the group, as Ruben mentioned, is composed by people f with completely different backgrounds, some more on the infrastructure, some more on the workflow side. Uh, so it's like we are having very, very healthy debate about what's going on there, and we are trying to refine this spec and the language that it's defining this spec as much as we can to make it simple to use and, you know, and to be able to uh, provide flexibility to implement different use cases. The use cases in general can be divided in, like, in three big buckets. Uh, the first bucket is serverless function orchestration, which is the most common thing that you think about workflows in the serverless context, which is basically defining the sequence in which you want to call a set of functions, right? You, you can say, okay, first I want to call that function, then move to the next state and call a different function and define the sequence. The second one is about flow coordination. and This is more related to events when you're waiting for things to happen in order to move to the next state, right? Uh, and the third one, which is a little bit more controversial based on other specs and other frameworks and other tools, 
is manage uh, data flow, which is basically having the right information at the right time to call functions, right? So if you are planning to run func uh, call functions in a sequence and the third function requires a certain set of arguments in order to be called, you need to collect that data from previous calls and move that uh, forward. And the same, uh, that also includes making decisions based on the data that the functions are returning and, you know, and creating conditions based on that. Yeah, as, uh, well, we're talking about serverless and, and functions and so, it is, uh, it makes sense, it, a lot of, se of sense to understand that we, we will uh, use this inside of a event-based uh, architecture. So all the communication should be uh, from our understanding through cloud events because cloud events uh, is uh, the the tool the like the wrapper that we we should use for uh, this uh, event communication um, with that way we consider that uh, we should use cloud events not only for uh, in receiving uh, events from uh, Sources, yeah, events from external sources. Yeah, to start uh, workflow workflow instances, but also to interact with functions. That way, we unify the way of commu uh, the communication uh, and makes easy not only for the implementation of the, uh, for the workflow impl uh, implementations, but also for the for the function interaction. Um, so as we go throughout the, the workflow. Uh, and while we wait for events to come, because it's, uh, it can be also an, an event orchestration, um, we should be able to, to know at a certain point where the workflow is and what is waiting for and uh, what has been uh, done so far. Yep, uh, so as we're only saying, cloud events, first class citizen, the integration needs to be pretty fantastic there. Uh, and we are working close to the cloud events groups in order to make that happen. And if you are in the cloud events groups and want to get involved, please get in touch because we would love to have someone actively working with us on that front to make sure that we are doing the right things, at, you know, in the right way. Um, and yeah, and then state handling, of course, that's that's super important. So what we have done until now is we have uh, like the language definition using a JSON schema that basically defines a set of states and se uh, a set of state state types inside the workflow definition, which basically represents, you know, the transitions between uh, calling different functions. Uh, the language itself, the main idea of the language is to be compact and human readable. We want to, we want to keep it simple, right? And it's, it is a tough, a tough task. It's not easy to, uh, to achieve to create like a JSON structure that it's representing a complex sequence uh, in, you know, in a readable form, but we are, you know, pushing hard in order to get that done. And again, based on uh, previous experiences, we know that these, you know, these languages tend to get quite complex and we are fighting against that. We are just trying to make sure that this, the complexity of the language is quite small uh, and we will do our best to keep iterating and keep refining the language to make it you know, uh, simple. And because of that, we uh, are definitely including modularity like in the language and that basically means the idea of connecting multiple workflow definitions into a hierarchical way, right? So you can have different levels of workflows and you can call a workflow from inside a workflow uh, to make sure that you don't end up with huge workflows and you end up with little pieces that you can reuse. And some two extra features that are under review right now, it's metadata and extensions. We want to make sure that the language itself is extensible. We believe that each vendor can provide their own secret sauce. Uh, for that reason, we are including extensions kind of like at the core and the same uh, for metadata, right? We want to make sure that if you're interested in a set of workflows, you can just go and add metadata and just decorate uh, workflows in, in any way you want. Well, here we, we see oh, it is. Let's see if you can see that. Yeah. If you can see it. Uh, well, this is a snippet of an example of a workflow. And uh, at the top, we can see some uh, metadata like the workflow name, the workflow ID, and the and the version. Then we define some triggers that will be what the workflow is interested in, the kind of uh, cloud events that the, that will actually trigger uh, some actions in the in the workflow. Some will make the the workflow uh, start or progress uh, from a specific state. So 
we might be, in the case of uh, new uh, workflow uh, instances, we will want to define the type of the source, that the type of the cloud event we are interested in, and maybe the source as well, and we will identify it with a name. These events, these event types, doesn't need to be uh, defined here. Uh, they should. It's not the responsibility of the of the workflow itself to uh, define the to specify the the event types. That's why the catalog and some other discussions that will happen next are very interesting. But it's not again the responsibility of the workflow. Uh, in case it is um, uh, an event that the workflow is waiting for in order to progress, uh, we have to provide a way to uh, allow the, the workflow to correlate this event with, uh, with uh, an existing instance. And for that, we should maybe use the, um, the cloud event attributes, uh, like the subject, for example, the subject is, is a good candidate. Then there, is a, there are defined a set of states States are not only a conceptual state, they, they can also be considered like uh, steps or, or stages that the, the workflow we, we will go through, uh, depending on, on certain, uh, of the type of the, st of, of the state. Uh, in case uh, the, the types, the, st the state types that we have defined so far are the events, the event type uh, that will coordinate uh, they trigger the uh, trigger definitions that we have uh, at the bottom, at the top, and will make decisions to go to go next depending on uh, of the events. So we can have we can wait for one event of this or, uh, or aggregate and, and wait for uh, and synchronize multiple multiple events. Uh, then we have the operations, uh, that uh, the operations main, main task will be to interact with functions and delays, switches for decision making and also parallel, um, parallel states to create uh, a fork or to allow concurrent uh, execution of the, of the workflow. Yep. Yeah, I think. Yeah, finally, something that I want to add there, it's like uh, the, the thing that I mentioned at the beginning, it's like data handling, right? Uh, so it, each time that you have to call a function, you basically need to define a filter in order to decide what kind of payload are you going to send to that function. And uh, different states provide you know, these different mechanisms in order to do the interactions. And as uh, Ruben mentioned, we have the operation state, which allows you to call different functions inside that state and then expect for the events to come back. Uh, yeah, I, one thing I forgot is that, uh, of course, the, the data flow, uh, it's important. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we receive an event, this event will be the input of the first state that is triggered. The state might or might not transform the, the, the data. And the, this data, the outcome of the state will be the income of the next uh, state. And that's also why, in some cases, it's interesting to provide filtering functionalities mm -hmm. uh, to transform certain parts of, of the event. Uh, at, the, at this point, when we are calling functions, uh, I think that we believe that it's super important to start thinking about something that uh, Mark mentioned already about function signatures, because again, here we are just going to make references to functions, and it's going to be important for us to have like a common definition for that. Also, it's, it is important to mention that we are working on the JSON schema for this language, but we are not working on a graphical notation for it for now, right? So we are just putting a lot of emphasis into the structure of the language before even thinking about how are we going to represent the workflow like in the right side of the diagram, right? In this case, the, the diagram is only showing, you know, like the logical view of these states, uh, but that's just only informative for now. We are not planning to add into the spec the diagram, that the diagram notation. Uh, and also from the community side of uh, view, uh, we we have some code in there, right? So we have some codes, uh, code around tooling about APIs and parsers and uh, tools that will allow to create implementations. So if you want to read these JSON files and create, you know, in, for example, in this case in Java, and validate these these files and you know check with the schema, we are already having the community some uh, open source projects providing that functionality as well as a Visual Studio Code extension for creating these JSON files with some assistance. Uh, it is important to mention here that these uh, projects are open source and right now are outside 
of the you know of the of the serverless group. They are like third party right now, and it would be great if we move forward with this project to bring them uh, under, under the same umbrella. And we are also looking forward to get some more contributions on other languages, not only Java, right? Uh, and I'm super interested in the Go side, so I will start working on that probably uh, soon. Next. Uh, and okay, so just to summarize a little bit, the current status of the project is kind of like active. We are working and we are trying to engage more people. Even during this conference, we have been you know, talking with different people to get some feedback about what they want to see in here. Uh, just for us to make sure that we have more eyes checking the language that we are defining and the interest around this project. And we are getting like super good feedback and people is interested. Uh, we just need to coordinate, we just need to get you know, organized in a, in a better way in order to make sure that we move forward. Uh, we definitely think that there is uh, an interest there and uh, we recognize that most of the you know, serverless uh, uh, frameworks, they provide some kind of orchestration and we want to make sure that we bring something that, you know, can help you on, on that respect to be a little bit more vendor neutral and provide a specification that it's not tied to a single implementation. Yeah, um, so from here, from what we've done, from what there was before, and we believe that uh, also this uh, coming here has been very productive. We've been able to talk to many people that uh, we realized that they were really interested in, in serverless workflows, that some of them uh, are actively working on serverless workflows, but uh, this is what we uh, did from the beginning, uh, a few months ago, uh, but we decided to uh, actively work with this specification because we considered that uh, we should find uh, a common way to tackle this problem. And there are very interesting active discussions. The only thing we need is to focus on the most relevant ones and uh, have more people involved from different po uh, with different backgrounds, different point of views, and start working on a specific set set of uh, functionalities or or actually to move forward the, the specification itself so that uh, implementations can can follow. Um, we are also working on have a better uh, organization. Uh, so far, we have just uh, created pull requests, uh, started discussions on on GitHub issues, uh, but uh, we we will have uh, from now on uh, biweekly meetings that uh, everyone interested should uh, start joining. Here are the channels that uh, we have for uh, serverless workflow discussions. Uh, we encourage you to join the Slack channel or to subscribe to the, well, mainly join this, the Slack channel and uh, because the, the mailing list are, is not very active because the channel is not active, so why should the, the, <laughs> the email be? Uh, but also create issues on the GitHub repo, uh, submit pull requests if you are uh, in the mood, uh, and that's it. So. Yeah. Uh, just a quick a quick thing about that is that uh, we are like, so Ruan is working at Red Hat, I'm working at a company that's called Camunda, and we both are working on some implementations for this, right? So we want to make sure that we provide examples uh, that people can see and they can run as well. Uh, and uh, we are working together, that basically means that we are committed on making sure that the language can be executed and uh, people can use it, and examples will come early next year for sure, like in, in a public way. So. If you are also interested in doing something like that, just get in touch and we can all work together. Thank you guys. Thanks. Question? Go for it. Are there any known commitment from existing solutions such as AWS step functions and Google Dataflow and things like that, that they have their own schema of how to define workflow? And another question is why you chose JSON and not YAML, for example? Yeah, okay, so two good, very, very good questions. So about commitments, not yet. So we are just basically initiating all the conversations. And we had some good conversations with some of the providers where they are saying, yeah, I mean, just do something and then just come to talk, talk, talk to us and then we'll see what happens, right? Uh, on the other side about uh, YAML or JSON, 
we have serialization for both, right? So basically, it's you know you can do it in YAML or in JSON, and it should work with both. Yeah, we are defining the JSON schema, mm -hmm. uh, but the the parser I which is implemented in Java uh, for now uh, can can marshal both uh, in both ways. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I I see that the the breakdown is very much a state machine. Yeah. And um, in the Kubernetes resources, they don't follow that model. Instead, it's status conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, was there any thought given to using status conditions for transitions between states versus uh, next next state? We are still under those discussions, right? So you, we are yeah. trying to evolve, right? And at that point, I think that it's a very valid like issue where you said, okay, let's compare this and see why that works in that way and why this works in that way. There are like different views on that, some, some of this stuff usually goes a little bit higher, on you know, a higher level of abstractions, right? It doesn't go that, that low, but I'm super happy to have those discussions because I think that there is here, this, in this kind of like topic, there is a clash between infrastructure and how the infrastructure works and then how the coordination orchestration kind of like works. And I'm super happy to do those, those kind of conversations to find the best way to do it. So yeah, please get in touch. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Maybe you guys can help with the running of the mics. Let's see how this is going to go. Doo -doo -doo -doo. All right. So that's sort of the end of the presentation side of this session. Now we're going to do something a little bit different. And we've done this at the previous two KubeCons with some level of success. Um, but unfortunately for you guys, it does require audience participation. This could be very, very short if you guys don't speak. So just prepare yourself. And Mark did warn you. So what we'd like to do now, though, is really find out from you guys what you're seeing, what you're experiencing, or in, the, in basically this entire space around serverless. In particular, you know, what, what are your pain points and stuff like that? So let's start off with some very simple questions. First of all, and I, I actually didn't ask this one at first in previous sessions, but I actually thought it was interesting. Um, how many people are actually using containers in production? OK, almost everybody. That's good. Believe it or not, I actually did not get that level of response, a positive response, in previous KubeCons. It was actually quite surprising. Because I slid off with the next question, which is, how many people are using serverless in production? OK, that's actually more than we actually got in some of the other places, which is, which is good. So OK, wait a minute. Uh, dun -dun -dun. OK. so. If you're using serverless in production, how are you guys using it, right? Is it to host your applications? Is it for CI CD tooling? Anybody want to volunteer to explain where you guys find that serverless is, the, is more beneficial than just straight, like, Kubernetes kind of stuff? Here you go. Can you clarify by serverless do you mean? Oh, yeah. By serverless do you mean, like, fully managed functions as a service, things like? Excellent question. It, it, it's up to you how you want to define it. it and to me, it at least means at least it's a function. So it could be function as a service. I don't think, for me, um, I'm asking whether it's necessarily full-fledged serverless, because sometimes people define serverless as, I don't see a charge for it, scales to zero and stuff. So from my perspective, I'm asking about functions through the serverless game, through the serverless range, if that helps. So it could be open, fast, running on yes, your Yes, definitely open, fast fits in that, yeah, def definitely. But you didn't answer the question, or you didn't, no, you want to? <laughs> oh, okay. No, that's good. It's a good follow-on question. You're right. I think, at least from my perspective today, there is a cloud lock-in, which causes function as a service to be used mostly as a DevOps tool or to react to cloud native services events, and not as a substitute for container for computing. <laughs> and uh, I think it will go there, and it's mostly more uh, common in the on-prem when you have co your own Kubernetes cluster and you want to simplify for developers the coding with Knative and stuff like that, then you'll see more the computing use case. But today, on, at least in the public cloud, uh, no public cloud exposes the actual event that their native services are emitting you, they're only being admitted to their own Lambda or whatever the, the serverless is. So it's mostly used for that. So even if you can do your own uh, serverless running on the public cloud, 
then the benefits are severely diminished unless you also pass through the native lambda that acts as a proxy to the, your own lambda. So that's, that's kind of. I want to make sure I understand that. Can you, um, yeah, Zerg, I'm going to ask you to elaborate. I apologize. <laughs> but when you, can you elaborate on term? I, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to understand what you said there, because I, I kind of understood it, but then I'm, I'm trying to equate that into a, a next step in terms of what you'd want to see to reduce that pain point. So if it's not a privileged event, like today, let's take, for example, just one cloud, like AWS. They don't emit cloud events. Mm -hmm. And even if they would emit something that you would, they don't even expose what they emit. Like, let's say you wrote something to a bucket in S3. You can say that it, a Lambda function intercepts that. But your own serverless can never intercept that. They just don't give you the access to that layer. Interesting. Therefore, no open source project or any RFC would help that with that. So where it mostly efficient is in the computing use case, which is saying, hey, instead of using container, just use serverless, but it's kind of green for that because the serverless doesn't have the richness of the containers yet. Uh, but do you believe that it's, <clears throat> is that related to the lack of a standard definition of function signatures at all, or is it completely independent? I think it's independent. I think uh, public clouds uh, have a lot of, uh, there, there, is no, there is no decoupling between the public cloud function as a platform or as a, or, or as a managed host provider versus the public cloud services. And as a vendor, as an external vendor, you cannot get the same APIs, privileged API, that the cloud itself uses as, as an internal vendor. And that's what starts, that's the, the root cause of the problem. So, so that is, I can speak for Azure, that is definitely not true. Um, you have the same level of, of access to APIs and layers and, and that we have too. If you want to run Service Fabric on VMSS, which is what we do for our services, you can do that. If you want to run on Kubernetes, you can do that. You can go effectively build, you can build the same host that Azure Functions uses um, on Azure exactly as we do it. Um, we're using effectively, um, we have some secret sauce, right, clear. Um, the way how we're using, for instance, Service Fabric is uh, something that we don't necessarily uh, uh, put on GitHub. Um, because we compete on efficiency, but you have exactly the same level of access to tooling as we do, so you can go and build your own, you can build the same things. And I, what I would say in terms of fidelity of containers versus VMs versus uh, FAS, it depends on what you want to do. Um, so first of all, let's talk about locking, right? You write a piece of code, and the piece of code has talks to dependent, downstream dependencies. The lock-in you're getting is what, the, what you're calling and not necessarily what your host interface is. The host interface is actually relatively easy to, to change. Whether you put a, uh, a node function, an, a, a node uh, web service inf implementation, whether you run that inside of Nginx or whether you, write, you host that into IIS or whether you host that into, into functions, the hookup into the dispatcher is basically the same. The, the real, the real tie-up is really what you call downstream. But I, don't, I, would, I would argue for, for typical, if you write a typical microservice, headless, that talks to a database, um, that thing is portable today because you can move it between Nginx and Azure Functions and Lambda in the most part because that code is not so complicated. That code doesn't really have all those, all those deep requirements. So ju just to make sure that I understood you correctly, you're saying that, let, let's say I want to give a WAF to build a, a web application firewall for serverless functions as a security layer, right? And I want to make it generic. And I don't want to use, again, I'm using the Lambda because I'm more familiar with AWS. I don't want to use AWS Lambda. I have my own uh, serverless uh, thing. You give me access to 
any customers that, uh, let's say, write to an S3 or to an object store or writes to a database and triggers some function can call my custom serverless instead of the cloud native serverless uh, service. I, I okay. mean, that, instance, that's good. That doesn't exist in AWS. For, for instance, so in, in Azure, we, we run all the events through EventGrid. <coughs> and an EventGrid can call, when you have an EventGrid event, you can go and trigger things that we have in the platform, or you can go and trigger any webhook. And then you can go and implement a HTTP uh, implementation anywhere. You can go and do that in your container. You can do that in Azure Function. You can do that whatever you want. Yeah, understood. So, uh, I was going to answer the original question, but sure. uh, also, it's free form. Go for it. I, I want to take the time to respond to this because uh, I also I had the experience of joining an enterprise as they went into the cloud, and I saw get to saw, see them, watch them adopt serverless for application development. And there's a spectrum, I think, of how that happens. But I also work at Amazon, yeah. and <laughs> I on open source, and I think a lot of what you're saying. There are solutions. You can, 99% of event flow from services is going through CloudWatch events. And you can publish your own events through that. You can subscribe to that. You can have that delivered to your custom engine. A lot of this is just translation, frankly. And subscribing for SQ S3, you just pick it up to an SQS event source, pull from it, send to your, your custom serverless runtime. There's already lots of event bridges that are happening for some of the uh, fast on containers. Yes, but work. you have to go through another service of, of the cloud. You cannot get them directly like your Lambda gets. You get, give him a microphone when he's talking, just so we have it on the recording. Just thank you. All I'm saying is that uh, it, it requires you to subscribe to yet another cloud native service like SQS, SNS, or, and also it's in a limited manner. You cannot directly consume it just like Lambda consumes it. I want to address. So, so I'll add that, you know. <laughs> Any time that you have these events emitted, they're going to go onto a message bus of some kind, SQS, Event Grid, uh, which will be a public cloud service. But I consider that as you know, you need to have some way to do the buffering and, and everything else. So uh, you you can't avoid having some kind of uh, message bus there. You can have the serverless directly get them. You don't necessarily need a queue because yeah. you have built-in. You know, any any uh, proxy or application server is able to to get multiple requests, buffer them, and scale automatically. So you, you don't want the extra latency. The queuing use case is good for other use cases. When you have uh, maybe no re non real time, or you want to have a pool instead of push model, so it has its place, of course. But so uh, I, I would disagree with that <laughs> because because stuff fails and things are unevenly fast or slow. So if you have a, um, if, you're calling, if you're calling an event handler that you provide and that thing is dog slow, then I better have a queue in the middle because I don't want to, I want to de decouple my publishing of events. If you're doing big data and you're doing uh, a streaming just like Kafka or not, yes, this use case, yeah. But for no, real I time, I, I, <laughs> this I, I is a, a, a very bad pattern. So, no, no, no. So, so I'm pl writing platform, and I can't trust your code. What I can't do is I can't trust that you that your code is gonna is gonna execute within 30 milliseconds. Is is web your web request going into a, a, a Azure, going through a queue? When, Absolutely. When, when you go to the CDN, every like every 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 event you're that going we, through a persistent queue. Every event that we run, so EventGrid has a persistence layer that holds events for 24 hours. In the first, in the first 30 minutes, it, it sits in a replicated me in-memory ring that spans up to 128 machines per cluster. And then once the, it ages out, it goes, it goes to disk. But it always sits, we have, we have specially dedicated queues that hold the events. And as I'm not talking about event, HTTP request. When a browser emits HTTP requests to a web server, do you go through a message queue or do you get it directly to the application? Well, server? that actually, actually, that depends on what the what, what the use case is. For instance, so uh, that's for, exactly the use case I'm talking so, about. So hang, for real hang, time, if, for real time. Hang on, sorry. Bing. So, so Bing. I, so, so, so just just <laughs> let me see. Bing. So the the Bing search engine. Um, when you type something in and you send send me that, 
it does a fan out query, it does a fan out request one way to several subsystems, all of those go and reply, and then that gets consolidated. And yeah, that, there's, there's queues. They're in memory queues, but they're queues. Th that's not an, an example. That's a specific application, specific uh, use case that you mentioned. Well, you that's not the generic HTTP so request you response. Asked, you asked the question, case. and I said yes. Yes, there's room for queues. That's no doubt about that. Uh, uh, but the, there is a lot of more use cases that you don't want to use. <coughs> okay, so, so, sorry. Okay, so. So I wanted to come back to the original question. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> so I, I initially saw a lot of server uh inside of an enterprise that was adopting cloud coming in the DevOps space, like the random one-off tooling, the cron, lots of cron jobs, um, doing things, moving assets. Then you start to see more application-oriented things, and that typically revolves around like object storage, ob observability, doing data processing pipelines, and then you get sort of sort of like the final level of serverless in some way is actually developing applications there. And in many ways, you know, you get that comfort level as you go up the stack of being able to to build that way. Um, the value proposition on it becomes more clear, I guess, and both in how you're architecting the apps on the platform, uh, the platform's value in taking care of security, not worrying about hard bleed, et cetera, um, and dealing with you. But there's still pain points. And then there's, you know, containers and serverless are gonna become a spectrum as people choose. But when you get to building the applications that way, there is a cloud lock-in, like that, that's clear. If you're on one of the hosted platforms. The, value chain that I came around to was that it's actually going to be easier for us to rewrite it if we need to go. So in your opinion, that progression that you described, was that because it, it required a learning curve, a comfort with this new technology kind of thing? It wasn't, it, it wasn't so much they didn't think they could use it for the final goal, it's just they needed to work their way up to it in baby steps kind of a thing. Yeah, okay. a lot of it, you know, some of it's risk management around portability, some of it is comfort around how you're monitoring these things, how are you deploying these things. Um, so, I mean, there's a learning curve as far as what best practices is in organizations, like most of this conference is, you know, shared lessons from organizations as they adopt containers and what are those best practices are. Um, and so in the same way, that happens within a serverless adoption for an organization. Okay. Before I ask my next question, Vlad, I know you want to say something, so go yes, for it. Yes, I desperately do. <laughs> <laughs> to have some context for this whole discussion about lock-in and portability, I want to address that a tiny bit, if you let me. So first of all, containers being portable is not true. Kubernetes is not portable. It is up to a certain point. As soon you get, as soon as you get an ingress, for example, you're gonna get custom annotations. You have annotations for low, for elastic load balancers, you have different annotations for application load balancer, you have different annotations for Nginx, different annotations for traffic, and so on and so forth. What uh, serverless is taking to the extreme is that lock-in, but that lock-in is not something that is uh, that bad. That lock-in for a lot of company means I don't have to care about stuff. It is managed for me. I get to, if I want to build a service, I can build that in half an hour a day instead of spending four days trying to get Kubernetes cluster running, trying to get it up. It is locking in the, and that is treated as a bad word, but especially with serverless, it just means that somebody, be it a startup which has uh, fewer resources, be it an enterprise that just wants to move faster. Locking means that I can offload my stress, I can offload maintaining stuff that do not bring me business value and revenue what to somebody else. Mike, hold on, microphone, because... Does the Amazon person, oh, Mike, Mark has it. Okay. So what is our community doing here? If we just give a, a yield to the, to the public cloud, let's not be a developer and let's be a builders, just drag and drop the solutions and we, it's worry free, mm. right? I've, uh, we're gonna get into something way deeper here, but my <laughs> job as a software developer is not to build cool code. That is a nice <laughs> uh, aside, but my job is to bring value to my customers, period. They don't care how cool my code is. They don't care how awesome I have my backend. They care if it works, if it's fast, and if it's cost efficient for them. We like to 
well, I'm trying to find my words here without being dismissive, which would be bad, because this is a real concern. We're trying to be a very awesome and proud of our implementations, but at the end, there are people who care more about delivering uh, value to customers super, super fast in smaller teams with less experience. I don't have experience managing the queue. I don't want to know about buffering. AWS can handle that for me. And that lock-in, that offloading of uh, maintenance effort and implementation effort is something that is bringing value. There are valid concerns, especially if you want to have a lot of regulatory compliance moving between clouds and the likes. But lock-in being something considered bad is not valid. It is an offloading of effort. And if that is uh, a trade-off that is good for somebody, then somebody needs to decide if it's a good trade-off for them or not. We cannot decide that. So I don't think we should be treating locking as something that's There is that definitely bad. a huge uh, uh, community of people that are the builders. And I think they, they, they usually go to reinvent and uh, events like that. Uh, I think the community of the open source tries to find, to create something that is not necessarily consuming the, the, the cloud native Lego pieces and trying to create an alternative that can do do-it-yourself approach. And it can live side by side with the public cloud, but you know, if, if you don't care about locking and you just want, so you're not a, a software vendor, you, are a, you have a business that uses software, but you're not a, a, a software provider like an open piece, but, and that's completely legitimate. So being from VMware, we definitely have customers that want to run serverless on private clouds. There are different use cases for delivering into uh, edge locations, other air gap locations that may need something other than the public cloud uh, serverless uh, solution, not to mention the fact that being able to have commonality of that runtime of that implementation across multiple clouds could still be useful for some customers that are delivering in multi-cloud. So that's a question to follow up on Vlad's comment. Of the people who are using serverless today, either in private or public, or production or, or not, was the potential for lock-in to whatever platform you're using a concern? Or did it not matter, it's just you just, you just want to use it to get your job done? I see you saying it wasn't a concern. It was, was, it, what is it, was it a concern for anybody? I'm curious. I'll hold it, but no, it wasn't a concern. I mean, we're just, we're, we're just starting with it. I agree, it's, it's getting it done. And also private, on your on-prem data centers, there's nothing, right? There's, there's no product to really get that you can get from somebody, more or less, um, that is like a Lambda equivalent or a Functions equivalent. It's just not there. So... Most people don't have a choice unless you write it yourself, as far as I know. I don't know all the products. I'm sure there might be something out there, but. So for Knative, uh, lock-in absolutely was a, a thing that we wanted to avoid. So uh, it's an open source project that you can implement in, uh, you can host it on the Kubernetes cluster, but there are vendors that expose that same API, and you can choose a managed version and get the the lock-in, but the API and the reference implementation can be portable. So I think there, there are movements to get both. But, but I think it's an interesting question, though. So uh, anybody else? Yeah. yeah. So going back to your question, uh, you know, I wonder how much, like for this gentleman here, it wasn't a, an issue for lock-in because potentially you were already on that platform. You were already committed to that cloud, right, that, that public provider. And so that was the, the solution that you went to use. You know, for, for other individuals who are either not committed to a, a certain public cloud or looking for something that can, uh, as you said, span, uh, you know, hybrid uh, setups, you know, I, I th feel like that lock-in question is potentially more sensitive. So it, it, it sort of shades your question, I think, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anybody else want to comment on that? <laughs> Just to add, you know, if the different public cloud, and we have few of them, right, because that's, that's the uh, oligarchs that we have. So uh, they would have made to a consensus or get an RFC of how they do stuff. 
it would have been easier to move, like the browser, for example. But they don't. They move in different paces, different feature sets. And uh, all we'll, we've left is, is just as, as a developer, is we are locked into their choices and their own developers that make it wrap it in a nice, convenient way to consume. Uh, we've seen cases of public clouds taking open source like MongoDB or other things or Presto, packaging it up with their own proprietary APIs and just saying, hey, now it scales on all of my, and basically this is exactly what kills the open source and kills initiative like that, that to find a schema. Why should we find a schema? Let's just take step function schema and we're good with it. MongoDB and, and, and that's Elastic. the reason I'm at least in KubeCon is because the community for itself can create its own standard and not uh, uh, be dragged to the decision making of, of any specific public cloud. Gentleman over there. Uh, one moment. Uh, well, one, th one little thing to say. I think we actually went too far from the original question. <laughs> and uh, I don't want <laughs> to add to that, but I want to add something. Um, I agree 100% with the gentleman in front. Um, put it this way, maybe it's a sin to say for the software person uh, that we don't care how software is written, but to a certain extent it actually became true. Because the, the main uh, goal for our work is actually to deliver the business purpose, uh, the business value, right? From that perspective, um, I actually really don't care where that functionality is running and how it's running. As long as I satisfy the business, as I satisfy the SLA criteria. So, with that said, we, we uh, started discussing is it HTTP call directly, is it HTTP call through the messaging platform, uh, through multiple messaging platform, et cetera, et cetera. Why does it actually matter? Because, or, or why lacking actually matter as well? Because, it is matter today, by the way. Why? Because all platforms behave differently, and in order to wire it up um, with a generalized interface, it actually takes uh, development, very significant development resources. Um, if we have, uh, like AWS, for example, three, has three queues, and Azure has five, as long as my latency satisfies my requirements, I, it doesn't matter for me. Oh, and by the way, and I want uh, the event that could actually calls my serverless service uh, to, be, uh, to come in with uh, cloud events to the specification. In that case, I understand what I'm getting, and my customer understands what I'm giving to, uh, to him. That's it. Uh, if all clouds actually behave the same way, basically, I understand what they give me and when, and what the latency around, uh, around that, uh, those requirements are, I'm, I can move anywhere, and I don't care about locking. I don't care about uh, the specific technologies they use. Um, basically, I don't care yes, anything. But, but they also behave differently, not only under the hood, also what they expose in their APIs. And you know, it's easy to get the 80% of what you need from the public cloud, but once you get to the 20% that they don't yet have in their roadmap, then you'll find it's more than 80% of the effort to get it there. I agree with you 100%, by the way, that's why. And, I, and they also ups, uh, upsell their services. So you start with just one service. You say, hey, let's just start with Lambda, mm -hmm. for example, or something. Then you see, oh, I need CloudWatch. Oh, I need security. Yeah. And oh, I need that. Quickly, you use almost all of the public cloud services. I agree. And, it quickly and becomes you're totally luck. hooked, right? It quickly become like, becomes luck and doesn't matter what, what uh, cloud we're going to. That's, I 100% agree with you. That's why I, say, I said today that locking is a concern because the service, uh, the methodology that uh, those clouds deliver calls to me are not unified across the board. But we actually value this uh, intent of the uh, cloud events and the serverless. I hope we're going to get some time. I mean, it's probably not going to happen soon. soon. But eventually, if we get there, that I think is the main purpose for us to, to go, right, uh, to, to, to get. So let me ask this. <clears throat> of the people who are using any kind of platform, public or private, just with a show of hands, how many people are concerned about lock-in? How many people are not concerned with lock-in? Okay. 
I just want to get a sense of the room. Okay, thank you. Now, so we heard some talk about the types of use or workloads people are using for serverless today. And we heard a full range from the gentleman from Amazon. Anybody else want to volunteer what kind of workloads you guys are finding are best suited for serverless? And in terms of what made you go to serverless in the first place as, as opposed to just straight Kubernetes. Anybody else want to volunteer? Yes. Thank you for joining, by the way. So we operate our own platform, and so we lock our developers into our platform. Um, and I think everybody's answer is going to be a little bit different depending on who exactly is their developer, what do they have yesterday, and what do they want tomorrow, and you know w what are their requirements for workloads. So you know we have a broad spectrum, you know, low latency requirements and. Um, you know, event-driven things. So, um, you know, when I see binding based on events as a kind of key point in defining workflows, I think that's really useful for some of our um, use cases, and it's not useful for our low latency type of workflows. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, depending on you know, who exactly is your developer. Our developers aren't, they don't know what Kubernetes is. Um, they, they may not even know what AWS Lambda is. Um, but they know our products and they trust our platform um, and that's what they get. And so you know, with or without knowing it, they are you know, getting locked into our platform in the same way that kind of people are describing lock-in at vendor platforms. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in in terms of what kind of workloads you're, you're using for serverless? Okay. Next question then, for the people who are using serverless or functions, what were some of the pain points you experienced? Or is it simply a matter of education and time to get used to it and, and fear of the unknown, as the gentleman from Amazon was talking about, that progression kind of thing? Are there specific pain points you ran into as you started using this stuff? None? Down over there, yeah. <laughs> so I'm not a developer myself, but I was the product marketing manager for Azure Functions. Clements, I'm not going to share any confidential information here, but <laughs> <laughs> cold start is one thing that we continue to hear from people. Uh, there are several scenarios in which people would find that just spinning up a function and serving up an API, which can be consumed by multiple different endpoints, can be very useful, but cold start, issues always uh, prevent them from doing that. OK, that's a good one. So now, what's interesting is that's more like a, a runtime characteristic that was a, a problem for it. it was, it's, not, it's, not, it's actually not the, the kind of thing I had in mind. I was thinking more like, what was the pain point in actually just writing a function or ho trying to host it? I mean, that's a great answer. It, it's, it's great to know that actually, cold start matters. On that note, the other thing that we uh, hear from a lot of people is that it almost forces you to think in a new way. Like for example, if I've been building my applications in a certain way, not, not everything was designed to be event driven, uh, an event being consumed by a functions and, and some computation being done as a result of that. Uh, but this, this new model forces you to sort of restructure your applications that way, which is sort of a friction point for, for some people. Yeah, yeah the, okay, but we have, and we have heard that in the past. You know, one of the things that, would, that uh, I thought was a great feedback we got from the first time we did this was some people said basically, you know, we're, we're trying to wrap our heads around containers. We're still coming up to speed on Kubernetes, and now you want us to break it apart even more. Right. And you're not giving us the tooling to manage this stuff. So how are we going to do all this stuff? How are we going to manage, you know, we're having trouble managing 50 microservices, and now you want us to manage a thousand functions. I mean, seriously, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so there's some there's some concern there. So yeah, developer experience, like how do I debug? How do I like how do exactly. I manage? Exactly. Yes. Know, okay. So you are experiencing that as well. Okay, that, that's good to know. Yeah. Anybody else? But let me ask you a question though. The the your, your migration. I'm sorry. Your statement about having to think about designing your application differently to be more event driven and stuff like that. Yeah. Do you view that as a step in the right direction or just a necessary evil to use the new technology that you're going to get benefits from? I, I think that you know, the majority of computing that is being done today is in the context of applications that exist today. You know? If I have to start a new application, most definitely you know, I'll, I'll go in the direction of a lambda or a function or 
cloud runs and things like that. But if I have to think about, okay, I have, I have my existing application, which probably is running on premises, and my next step is to take it to the cloud, would, my, would I introduce additional work by you know, re-architecting it in a fast way, or would I just put it in a container and just host it? So those like, you know, existing applications is, is where that friction point comes in. New applications, yes, most definitely people will pick up because it is easy, easy to prototype, it is easy to get a proof of concept going and so on and so forth. So, so it's interesting, so I'll make sure I got this right. So for new applications, you're not seeing resistance from developers to jump on board with the, the function serverless paradigm. It's I, would always say, I would say there is higher acceptance uh, okay. for new applications by developers in trying these things out. That's good to know. Okay, thank you. Um, Scott, okay, thank you. I, th I want to build on that a little bit. Um, one thing I've been thinking about, about serverless and containers and application development and that we this group never really talks about. Uh, if you have Kubernetes, you're not really scaling to zero because you're still going to have those nodes. I'm sure like there's Kubernetes clusters that scale, but what I tend to use serverless for on Kubernetes clusters is to over provision a cluster that has highly dynamic workloads. So I get I get to deploy like uh, like an airline and oversell all of my nodes. And I think that's maybe the the thing for me that's interesting about serverless and containers and Kubernetes that resonates. But it's interesting, you, I think you, when you say that though, are you, you're looking at it for, as a developer or as an infrastructure manager? Both. Interesting, do you think a developer actually needs to think about that stuff? I mean, so I, I spend most of my time at the control plane, and I'm, but I'm thinking about ways to reduce the footprint of the control planes in a serverless way because the control plane only has to operate once in a while. Mm -hmm. And it'd be really nice to scale that to zero when it doesn't need to be and let the cluster be for the application. Interesting, okay, Clemens. Um, uh, relaying a point of confusion that I get asked uh, occasionally. Um, so we have this, so there's this notion of microservices as a, you know, you can, we can see how far that you know, goes back to the SOA days and, and the notion of, of what a service is, but I think the general, the general uh, notion is that a, a microservice is, represents uh, the product of a team and it can be independently deployed, independently operated, and typically um, a microservice owns its own, you know, fate and store and, and data uh, is only shared through public interfaces, so all those good principles. Um, functions is interesting because it gives you a way to um, have a service span multiple artifacts because often it is so that a microservice or a service has been a thing that you develop as a module and then you would go and, and deploy that module in a container and then you would probably run multiple instances of, the instances of that module. Um, but it's basically just still a, a code unit of some form, right? It's an assembly, it's a, you know, what, whatever you call this, it's a library that you can go and run um, in some kind of a host. And that's what a service is often in the, f in, you know, how it's being used as a concept. And if you look at how people use uh, microservices in the context of container, it is certainly is like that, right? It's a it's a deployable unit, and that deployable unit then you know you run multiple instances of it. Now functions gives you a, f a completely different world, and people are confused because they think they think of they, they ask the question like, is a function a service? And that's probably not the right granularity necessarily, but fun functions gives you is a way to have a fleet of functions. Each of them potentially talking different protocols. Uh, each of them talking potentially having different scale points. We have a, one of the functions is more popular than the other, um, and where you can independently now now deploy fra fractions of your service and manage them independently. But they together that fleet talks to one database um, and is owned by one team. Um, and that's something that is a architectural change that functions make, makes possible, contrary to um, to you know the old model where everything was uh, is in deployment. It gives you a the, the possibility to go and, and um, have flexible operational characteristics for different slices of the same service. So, 
Good points. So the point. So that, 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 no, but that, that, what you're talking about there is just the benefits of functions and serverless. Yeah. So, so, but and, but, but the 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 people come. So the the pain point here, or or the point of confusion, is that people look at functions as a effectively as a microservice, and then they get confused about the complexity that is being introduced by that because now they have. You know, 1,500 different functions, and they look at 1,500 different functions as 1,500 different services, and that drives complexity up, and not as you know groups of functions that are that you manage together and you own together. Okay. So, okay, two questions ran through my mind. One is, of the people who did not raise their hand about using serverless in any fashion, why aren't you using it yet? Anybody willing to raise their hand? Is it because just haven't seen a need for it yet? There's something about it that scares you? Anybody want to volunteer to answer that question? Yeah. Um, we thought about using serverless. Um, we're using Kubernetes. And because in Kubernetes, it's very um, new, um, uh, we didn't want to use it because we, need, uh, we didn't want to use the cloud provided uh, serverless uh, solutions because we need uh, on we need on prem installation um, because it's very new basically. Okay, cool. Thank you. Anybody else? There's a gentleman back there. There are many internal reasons. I'm not going to mention those. They are not interesting. Uh, but the technical reasons, a uh, couple of them, uh, because uh, essentially they all come down to one thing. Uh, maturity of uh, serverless is not uh, equivalent of the normal services. That's, that's kind of it. Because the, uh, um, the cold, uh, cold uh, start problem, the um, ability to, s uh, to safely keep the state or work, even working with the state, and passing the state. Um, the uh, deployment um, and management, I mean, all those extra as aspects that uh, serverless uh, hasn't yet figured out as, as well as normal services, that's what actually prevents uh, from using that uh, at the same level. And I think overall, it kind of the question always comes. Uh, we we actually we still we were thinking to use it, and we are thinking to use it. We just haven't yet started it because we're kind of waiting for these um, all the elements to be settled. And You're looking for maturity. Maturity, yeah. yeah. And I think it's coming, just not there yet. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, the overall, that's what prevented. And when people asking like, okay, let's why not start with like one function or five functions? Um, I think the answer is uh, why bother? Because do they like will those couple of functions or resources that we spend to make those functions work and actually will worth it? And the answer is probably no. Interesting. So unless there is a like uh, critical mass built up uh, and the low level of effort to get into the serverless and having the same effect, um, that's probably not going to happen until then. Thank Actually, you. I, I like that answer. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, I, I'd just like to volunteer one sort of counterpoint to that is uh, while working in Azure, we noticed that people actually start with that one function or those five functions, and then they discover the flexibility of you know how quick it is, how like they can quickly prototype something and maybe get it to production really really quickly, mm -hmm. and then it grows that way, and they are they are organically able to like figure out newer new and newer and newer uh, use cases that they could not, they would not have thought earlier, like automate something, data transformations here or there, build an API, build, build a mobile backend, stuff like that. But I, I do have a related question on, on that. Uh, I, I'm curious how many people are using any of these open source functions frameworks running on Kubernetes in production? I'm, I'm always I'm always confused by the success of success of these frameworks. Like, why, why what exactly drives people to do that? It has to be the appeal of the programming model. <laughs> so I want this gentleman right here to answer. I think Klaus is he from SAP? I want now. Clemens, give him the microphone. Let him answer the question. Why on earth are you doing that? 
<laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, w we're using um, we, we're using Knative, and then we work with that, and uh, we use that to basically schedule all the different resources um, on the same cluster. In that sense, we overbook the cluster, we leverage the scale to zero, therefore we're able to put there more stuff than typically would run there. And we kind of game on the fact that uh, not all, everything is running at the same time, uh, which brings a certain level of efficiency. Um, and uh, since what we, what we run there serverless on Knative is typically small add-ons for, uh, for our software stacks, uh, that fits super nice. So I want to circle back to the thing we were talking about earlier, which was the whole lock-in issue. Um, I want to make sure we understand when you guys say lock-in, and this is for everybody who raised their hand that said yes, it's a concern for you. When you, when you think about lock-in, what aspects of managing, deploying, whatever you want to call it around your service, what are those aspects of lock-in that you're thinking of? Because to me, I think of things like function signatures and stuff, but that's a, that's a little too easy. Right. What are the other things that, that are, are the aspects of lock-in that, that you guys are thinking about, aside from things that, that really obvious? So I actually maintain an open source project that actually works against all three public, oh, three public cloud providers, uh, function, serverless implementation. And 95% of our code is roughly our business logic, and that is portable uh, across those. Like, so it is possible, it requires engineering work, requires automation around provisioning, the, the syntax for provisioning the cloud provider functions is extremely different. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll leave off on any more comments on that. Um, but, you know, so like getting the, <clears throat> getting your entry point in, getting your function signature, you know, taking your, your event and turning it into a business domain object, like that is very thin and it's very lightweight. Once you get to your business logic, that aspect of portability is straightforward. Now, the real question on portability is what the rest of your application is doing, and is it using other cloud ser services? The backend stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. So, do we want to make sure I understand, though? Is, so, we're using the backend services. Is it because each backend service is going to behave differently, so you feel locked in because the functionality isn't over here, or is it interacting with it? I'm assuming if the function API is a, an annoyance, not, a, not an inhibitor, I would assume the API to S3 versus something else is also going to be an inhibitor. It's whether the functionality is probably there, I assume, right? It requires building in the abstractions into your application. Like those services, the a queuing service, a fan out service, a, store, a blob store service, those are, you know, those are class abstractions with adapters that you put in your application. Yeah, right. That's work to do. Like, and that's a cost that you have to adopt and maintain. My, my initial comment on this was uh, it's for, it's, going to be easier for a lot of application teams potentially just look at it as we can if we need to do it that's a business to move it's a business decision and we'll just rewrite it because that will be faster than trying to stand up a bunch of truly portable native uh, portable infrastructure um, obviously kubernetes makes that a lot easier uh, and so potentially that's possible but you're also locking yourself out of the feature value set of having managed services so let me pick on you a little more, though. How, if you could wave a magic wand, how would you ease that pain point? It's an interesting question. I, I don't know that I have a great answer. Potentially, it's abstraction libraries on a language level. Um, potentially, it's better operators for data services uh, in Kubernetes such that it is easy to operate that, that portable stack. Okay. Are you going to say something? No, I'm, and maybe just prevent these function services from making it stupid easy to, to consume the other cloud services, you know? <laughs> so make the life of users hard, that's what you said. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> OK, we actually are running a little on time. What I want to do, uh, let me see what kind of questions we had here. So. I think this is the list that Mark showed earlier. Uh, the ones in bold are actually the things that sort of, for lack of a better phrase, got the most votes yesterday when we were talking about areas of possible next steps for us to work on, focus on interoperability and stuff like that. When you guys look at this list, would you agree with the stuff in bold? I think, mean, for example, we had function signatures on there. You're suggesting, eh, it's an annoyance, but it's not really huge. Is, is there, are, there, are there other things 
on the, that we should include on this list in terms of interoperability, harmonization, whatever you want to call it, to get some level of portability or interop between these cloud providers? So I was curious, where is the, the workflow on this? It, it's not on here because that, we are definitely doing that. This is what new thing we want to begin. The, the workflow is going to continue. Because, to be honest, the, yesterday, actually, if I was to narrow this down even more, subscription API, meaning a standard way to talk to an event producer to ask for events, that's what subscription API means, and then function signatures. Those two seem to get the most votes yesterday. Yeah, it's Scott's pushing discovery. <laughs> but I'm curious. Do you guys agree with that, or do you think, eh? I, you don't, we I, don't know what the answer is, but. I, but I, I, Scott's going to say it's discovery. Yeah, wait, wait, Scott, let, let the, let the non-member team speak first. Yeah, basically, if, <laughs> if, you don't, if, if, you, if you don't have what to um, subscribe to, you cannot subscribe. I'm sorry, what? If, like, you don't have the, the discovery there with the event registry, there is nothing to subscribe to, right? Uh, I'm sorry, is your name Scott? You're, you're echoing him. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I, I know. Yes, sir. Sorry, quickly. Uh, so I think the list is awesome. It's uh, hard to argue. But I think I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it easier, maybe more complicated. Um, I think what's important is not the list only, but dependencies. And I think that gentleman actually pointed to that, made exactly that point. Like, if we are addressing discovery and there is no schema registry, then why, like, what's the point to have it? Yeah, to be and honest, so, I th just my opinion, but I think, some, well, yes, I agree, some of these things are related. Mm -hmm. I think we, we split it out because we wanted to do incremental baby steps of things. We didn't want to try, all, try to come out with an entire architecture all at once, say, here's what your entire serverless framework needs to look like. We want to do tiny little bits. That's why, web, that's why cloud let, events are so small. Let, let me clarify. I see this list as uh, not a list, but uh, rather a uh, tree structure. Okay. And you start from those down below libraries. Yes. And you get out. And so what would you put as the low-hanging fruit? Uh, the... Uh, Probably, since you already have, I think the, uh, the one step that you guys have already is the event, uh, cloud events. Mm -hmm. So the next one will be discovery and the schema registry. The next one is subscription. The next one is a function and, and packaging and so forth. Okay, so Scott number just, three. Just uh, an example. <laughs> I agree with that. I know you do, yeah. Me, me too. <laughs> so does, does well, Scott, one, two, and three are all in agreement, got it. The discovery was uh, like, if we, so we have cloud events now, and we have the, like a way to talk about events and the payload and the attributes without a transport. So what would open API look like for cloud events, for event producers and consumers? Okay. Anybody else want to comment on the list or good, bad list? Yes, sir. Sorry for taking too much time. No, no, it's good. Uh, there, there, there is a one, another thing that I wanted to, ask, to say to come in. So the cloud events themselves, some of the properties like type, for example, um, and others, uh, they are actually very fuzzy, right? And I think they are for a purpose because the standard, the open standard, kind of has to should not limit what it can be used for. But in reality, I think what uh, eventually would happen, or at least I, I suspect it might happen. Uh, some of those properties will be defined more um, narrow, closer than they are today. Because like for example, type will be tied up, probably will be tied up with the uh, uh, ID in the schema registry, or the, the right? And that URL become, will become a discoverable URL. And the discovery itself but you see what I'm going, right? So uh, essentially some of those properties, the way those properties will be used to address all these concerns, they will tie it all up and become more clear how to use them and how they're supposed to look like and what kind of information they have to even embed in them. I, th I think the, the function signatures are independent of the API subscri the subscriptions and the discovery because we already have the cloud event, and so we can, like, the, the hope is that there's a little bit of glue for the lock-in piece, and then there's a function that you can copy and paste between the lock-in bits. So I echo that. Uh, with respect to, some of these are very cloud event specific, which is a incubation project, and others are 
you know, what does the serverless working group go after next, which could be additional, you know, workflows, I shouldn't say workflows, work streams uh, that we could take on multiple of these, but independently between cloud events and uh, serverless working group. <clears throat> so I believe technically we're out of time, but I want to sort of ask a very, very generic question, and I'm, I have a feeling I'm not going to get much of an answer, but I'll ask anyway, because it is kind of related to this, and that's, we've done a lot of talking here and just sort of guiding the discussion. Is there something else on your guys' mind about serverless that you see as an annoyance, something that's concerning you, something that you wish someone would try to tackle to try to bring the community together around some particular topic, whether it's a pain point or however you want to describe it. Is there something that's been running through your minds that you'd like to mention that you think we should know about just to think about? Yes. So uh, one of the things that, that has interested me has been around, um, you know, we have workflow, which is a declarative model to say what these functions should do. Uh, but then there's another kind of as you have functions that are deployed without such a structure, um, I think there'd be a great need to see what functions are doing, what backing stores they are talking to, and have kind of a, a passive view of the interactions between uh, events and what, and what backing stores uh, they're being persisted to or interacted with. So I think that that, that will, like, I don't think we've seen it uh, yet, but I think that that'll emerge to be a, uh, an interesting topic because you'll want to know what's what the lineage of this data has been from the time it was produced to the time it was persisted or transformed and persisted. Interesting. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on something you think we're not considering or thinking about as we go forward? Okay. In that case, thank you guys very much. I know it's a very unorthodox session, but from our point of view, we really want to get feedback from you guys, and I really appreciate you speaking up. We've had very quiet audience in the past. You guys have been great in speaking up, so I really appreciate it. And thank you guys very much for sticking around this late. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.